Lu Yuan was engrossed in a game of chess, honing his skills and marveling at his own improvement. Chan approached him while he was attempting to initiate a conversation. Lu Yuan urgently wanted to stop him, recognizing that the formation had recently been established. Removing it would require a minimum of 30 minutes, leaving no time available to do so. As soon as the protagonist entered the formation, it began to vanish. Lu Yuan, unaware of this, believed that it was all over. He feared that Senior Chan would be trapped and that he would be beaten by his sister. None of what Lu Yuan had anticipated occurred, as Chan effortlessly entered the formation and even managed to shatter it. Lu Yuan was surprised that it had suddenly shattered like that, and he pondered what type of master Senior Chan is. He stood up firmly and anxiously announced loudly that the monk who had been imprisoned in the morning had awoken, and her sister was questioning him inside. The protagonist told him to take him there so he could have a look. Lu Yuan instantly agreed to do so. During their walk to the cell, Lu Yuan informed the main character that his sister had expressed concerns about the monk potentially escaping due to his formidable magic. As a precaution, she had discreetly lit numerous forbidden incense sticks in the vicinity. Chan was pleased with her accomplishment. Lu Linglong was inflicting harm upon the old man in the cell. The elderly gentleman chuckled, wondering if this was the extent of her abilities. The elderly gentleman mocked her, stating that she was incapable of eliciting any reaction of pain from Tuchuo. Lu Linglong observed Chan and the others entering the cell. She respectfully acknowledged and conveyed that this monk proves to be quite challenging to question. The protagonist smiled, assuring her that there's no need for her to be formal. Xiao Wu stated to Chan that those who exercise physical fitness often had to undergo excruciating agony when training. And this guy is impervious to a single hit from him, and his cultivation is excellent. It would be incredibly difficult to learn anything about Emperor Zun from him. Xiao Wu seriously explained to Chan that people who practice physical fitness often need to endure tremendous pain when exercising. And this man is invulnerable to a single blow from him, and his cultivation is really good. It would be extremely difficult to get information about Emperor Zun from him. Xiao Yin decided to experiment with her weapon. Almost instantly, an aura began to envelop the old man. However, a protective barrier materialized around him, effectively shielding him from the technique as it faded away. Xiao Yin was surprised to see that her weapon had no effect on his mind. Both of them were beginning to worry, but Chan remained calm since he knew precisely what to do. He pulled something out of his clothing, and it was divine level medication. He created several items like this, but he didn't anticipate them to be helpful. The elderly man believed he was kidding because no one in the world could compel him to betray Emperor Zun. He pulled out a bizarre blue pill with a blue glow around it. He put it into the elderly man's mouth while he was still laughing. And he accidentally ingested the medicine. He instantly got extremely weak, wondering what Chan had given him, but it was too late, and Chan started questioning him about Emperor Zun. Emperor Zun instructed the Empress to reveal Chan's weakness. She quickly responded that his weakness was her. She said that she had earned his confidence even in the lower realm. She had planned on exploiting his strength to climb to the higher world, but she had not anticipated how hazardous it would be. Now that I am caught in Tutu, all I want to do is utilize that guy for another chance. Emperor Zun asked her what she wanted. She promised Emperor Zun that if she could fool him into going to meet him, she would become a powerful man below one and above 10,000 people on the Tianyuan continent. Emperor Zun presented her with a talisman of life and death. If she remains true to her commitment, this talisman will impart all the knowledge he has acquired throughout his life, enabling her to reach the extraordinary heights of the ten heavenly realms. She smirked, confident in her knowledge of his fairness and honesty. All three of them concluded that what the old man stated seemed to be of little benefit to them. They recognized he was probably a thug, and the emperor had not told him anything vital. The elderly guy said, what did he do to me? Chan claimed that he had told him all he knew about Emperor Zun. The old man was startled that he had betrayed Emperor Zun. He yelled that he would be murdered for betraying his emperor. Since this individual was no longer helpful, Lu Linglong proposed that he just murder him. With desperation on his face, the elderly man swiftly accepted to be executed so that he would not be chastised by Emperor Zun. Chan remembered that the old man used to not care about punishment, but now he is a coward who is terrified of it. He decided to take control over this old man. He went away, warning Lu Linglong not to murder him since he could still use him if he kept him. 
Lu Linglong bowed and promised to do what he said. Chan was practicing his new talent since he had discovered that with each level up upgrade reward, he could acquire a skill. He has recently mastered the technique of mind cloning. After finishing up, he was just about to head out when the system suddenly started scolding him, reminding him that he had only come here to upgrade, add a few points, and then make a swift exit. She asked with a touch of fiery sarcasm if he believed this was a hotel. The protagonist ignored her and just departed, deciding to test out his new talent. He utilized his newly acquired ability, the mind clone. A golden figure emerged from his body. And that figure became just like him, and they both exclaimed interesting simultaneously. The clone was already aware of another ability he possessed as a clone. A clone appeared suddenly within the cell. The old man was taken aback, as he came to the realization that Chan possessed the ability to extract a fragment of his soul from his physical form. He recognized the impressive strength of this young man in the Yuanchen realm. He showed great respect as he bowed deeply and humbly requested further assistance from Elder Chan. He then discussed an uncommon leader from the mermaid tribe who can guide the senior. Upon hearing that, Chan pondered if the individual in question was referring to Tianxin. He chose to set aside that matter for the time being. His entire body transformed into a radiant energy, and as he entered Di Gutua's body, he instructed him to release his consciousness and refrain from resisting. The elderly gentleman readily agreed. Chan had complete control over the old man. The protagonist smiled since the imprinting procedure of his mind avatar was really wonderful. He was astonished that he could immediately feel the elderly man's thoughts. It may even self-destruct its clone at any point, transforming him into an imbecile. The city was being rebuilt in Chan's image, and Di Gutua was in charge. Xiao Wu was anxious and inquired whether it was alright to release the old guy like this. Xiao Yin was also wary about the elderly guy, but Chan reassured them that this person's life and death are now fully in his hands, and he cannot cause any harm. A laborer informed his supervisor that there was a magnificently dressed lady beyond the city gate. She names herself Jiang Aihan. Chan was suspicious, wondering how she knew he was present. He instructed someone to bring her here. The protagonist was about to say something when the empress stopped him to tell him something vital. But she was cut off as a burst of power erupted from her, causing her to scream in agony. Emperor Zun's projection emerged, and he was angered that the lady had lied to him. He praised Chan's efforts in destroying the hunting saint mansion twice in a row, so he decided to offer him a present. Chan refused all of his presents and pledged to make him pay for hunting Jiang Aihan. The Empress experienced significant discomfort as a result of the negative energy present on her forehead. Chan evaluated her situation, and Xiao Wu questioned about the Empress's well-being. The main character described how Emperor Zun had somehow blocked her veins. If not addressed quickly, she will experience excruciating and unrelenting suffering, remaining conscious throughout. Xiao Wu and Xiao Yin were concerned, pondering if there was a solution to rescue her. The protagonist suggested using the silver needle catheter method as a possible solution. Xiao Wu and Xiao Yin were taken aback by this choice. Chan attempted to puncture the veins to release the accumulated spiritual energy. A dark purple energy emerged from Jiang Aihan's hand. However, he was aware that this method would cause her cultivation to decline drastically, making her much weaker. Xiao Yin felt sad, questioning if there were any alternatives. Xiao Wu comforted her friend, assuring her that as long as she remained alive she will be fine. Suddenly, the needle began to crack. It shattered abruptly, causing Chan to quickly step back to avoid any potential harm, as an even more potent surge of energy emanated from Jiang Aihan's hand. Chan skillfully neutralized the impending threat by swiftly harnessing the power of fire to incinerate the enigmatic energy. The protagonist opted to explore a different way. Xiao Fan attempted to puncture the veins once more. Chan recognized the potential danger and took immediate action to prevent harm to the Empress, choosing to break the needle. Xiao Wu inquired about his eye needle, and Chan said that the Empress now lacks spiritual capacity to safeguard her body, and the cold may easily cause frostbite, and she might die before then. The main character realized that the only way forward was to develop a substance that is not frightened of the strange spiritual force needed to construct lengthy needles for acupuncture. He inquired whether both of them had any suggestions. Xiao Wu recommended that he just call Di Gutua and ask. He came up with an idea while recalling what he did to Di Gutua. 
He instantly employed his new talent, mind cloning, and Xiao Wu and Xiao Yin were surprised to see both Chans. He informed his clone that he would entrust everything to him. The clone confidently stated that this task would be easy. The clone transformed into pure energy and entered Jiang Aihan's forehead. A surge of intense energy surged forth, transforming into a monstrous entity that let out a deafening roar, seemingly intent on attacking Chan. However, Chan skillfully activated his fire ability and successfully burned the monster, ultimately eliminating it. Following the defeat of the monster, the Empress began to slowly open her eyes. She instantly explained why she had come here so eager to meet him, she had come to warn him about Emperor Zun. She told him that within three months, he would do his utmost to remove the luck from his body. Chan didn't understand what she meant, but she explained it based on what she heard in prison. People who had previously advanced to the Tianyuan continent had their luck sucked away by him, and they eventually died from a lack of luck. The protagonist decided not to discuss this for now and he asked her to first inform him whether Tianxin had been captured by Emperor Zun. The Empress regrettably said yes. Chan refused to give up on his friends, as he was determined to rescue them all. Suddenly, someone reported that a bunch of thugs was causing trouble on the work site. Tuchuo, the huge guy, suffered major injuries as well. He advised him to go and have a look. Chan was stunned to hear this, and he quickly went there. On the building site, numerous thugs were spotted standing over Chan's defeated allies. One of the dogs informed Lord Envoy that everyone had been defeated and the guard had been allowed free. Lord Envoy was delighted to hear this, as he had planned that when Chan arrived, the action on the other side would commence. On the ground, the elderly man and the others were defeated. Xiao Wu was concerned and inquired why they didn't rush to get there. The protagonist smiled, explaining that the adversary would expect them to hurry so that they could secretly restore the plank road. Xiao Wu wasn't sure what he meant. So the main character explained that they had already controlled all twelve cities in Jiangnan. At this time, only Miqing sect members may enter the city and create problems. As he said this, his mind clone materialized. Xiao Wu wondered why it wasn't someone from Emperor Zun. The clone answered that he arrived in Ding City to hear about the meeting and went straight to the city lord's palace, rather than sending a pawn to report to them. The clone departed, and Xiao Wu was interested, asking which one was his sole clone and where it went. Chan suspected that the Miqing sect members insisted on transporting us, most likely due to the mirror on Lu Rushi's body. So he let his clone go to town. Xiao Wu and Chan arrived at that location. The opponent was present, and he was prepared to battle. Chan immediately realized that the action began when the signal was given. The redhead guy pretended to know nothing. The main character rushed at the guy, intending to kill him. The redhead rushed at him as well. Both of them punched, and their abilities collided. They backed away as both forces unleashed a shockwave. Chan smiled, recognizing that the memory from the clone's side had been returned, and it was complete. As a result, his level has increased, and even as a clone, he can easily defeat those enemies. Suddenly, the comrades of the redhead were swiftly defeated, falling to the ground. The clone appeared, and with a smile, Chan decided to present him with a few gifts, hoping they would trigger some memories. The redhead was furious as he unleashed his dark energy, shouting at the protagonist to stop pretending to be a ghost or possessing a secret technique. The mysterious energy that enveloped the characters in the mask, blood emanated from their masks upon their death. Xiao Wu advised Xiao Fan to be careful. Chan assured her that everything was being handled. The guy made a strategic decision to evade capture by using a portal and quickly escaping from the scene. Prior to his attempted escape, he didn't notice the radiant energy becoming attached itself on his feet. As soon as he stepped into the portal, it vanished, leaving Xiao Wu concerned that it had vanished without a trace. Chan was completely unconcerned as the clone had already followed. The guy arrived at the Miqing sect headquarters. The individual in the mask, was grateful that he escaped as fast as they could. Otherwise, he would have been captured and manipulated like Elder Lu. He noticed something from behind him and was taken aback to see that Chan had followed him. It was hard to believe, as his secret method could only teleport one person. The redhead threatened him with death. Chan ignored his warnings and looked around, unimpressed. The clone suddenly grasped the masked man's face, causing his mask to fracture. And he slammed the redhead to the ground, and the earth broke, knocking the man out immediately. The clone smiled, recognizing that he is stronger than he believed, 
and decided to exploit this to his advantage. While wandering about, he encountered several foes, but they were all mercilessly defeated by his strength. The clone was now standing in front of the treasure house, and the system emerged because she sensed that there was a lot of energy within that could be absorbed. The clone entered the treasure house like a ghost. He didn't know that someone was watching him, and this person was enraged. He was resolute as he prepared hundreds of years worth of methods to deal with Emperor Zun, which he would put to the test on Chan today. The clone wondered what he was holding as the system drooled over the wealth. She instantly asked that he give her the treasure so that she may absorb the energy it contained. When the energy bar is full, he may use the teleportation ability to go to other worlds or return to the Shenwu continent. Chan handed her the treasure because he didn't want to leave this area right now. He reasoned that Tianxin is still in Emperor Zun's clutches, and they won't leave until she's freed. The system joyfully absorbed the energy contained inside the treasure, and she inquired as to what the space energy would be used for after it was full. The clone instructed her to first create a storage space, and store all of the magical weapons in the storage space. The system gladly did what she was instructed. She began creating the storage space. The individual who was observing the clone failed to notice the system. Nevertheless, he observed the storage space with frustration as he realized the intentions of this boy. Using his technique, he skillfully manipulated the swords with his magic to eliminate Chan in that room. The swords converged on Chan, poised to strike him down. However, the clone dismissively swatted his hand away, clearly indicating that he was too busy to engage in any playful activities at the moment. As a result, all the swords were forcefully blown away. The individual was in disbelief over what happened. He chose to utilize another skill as he was determined in eliminating the clone. A formidable knight appeared before the clone. The system quickly decided to flee upon realizing the superior strength of the being compared to the clone. Nevertheless, the clone remained completely unconcerned. The knight swiftly launched an assault, yet the blade effortlessly passed through the clone. The leader believed they had emerged victorious. He wished for Chan to face the consequences of underestimating his power. However, he experienced a sudden bout of pain as he coughed up blood. The spirit energy within this clone showed to be more accessible for him, allowing him to execute his skill with greater ease. Chan skillfully directed his energy, striking the knight with precision and force. The clone was upset that the system was just standing there. He told her to go gather all of the treasures as soon as possible since the boss was likely to arrive. The system utilized the storage space to gather all of the treasures. The man clenched his teeth, having had enough. Purple electricity emitted from his mouth. He began to absorb the souls or something similar from his comrades. With all of his strength, his eyes glowed as he yelled, demanding that the youngster die. The clone could feel the enormous quantity of power. He instructed the system to collect all of the treasures and leave. The system had already finished collecting all of the treasures, and she was about to escape when she inquired if he wasn't coming. The clone said that he is not coming because he wants to test the limitations of this clone. A creature emerged and shouted for him to die. The aura surrounding the clone became stronger as he prepared to do something. Chan grinned as he got brighter, gleaming like the sun. And then he detonated, leaving no time for the creature to move. The explosion caused the person to burn. His last thoughts were about how this was possible, and he died. The explosion was so tremendous that it sent shockwaves around the city, similar to a nuclear bomb. The clone was astonished since he assumed the monster was powerful, but it turned out that it could be defeated by blasting a clone. This strange person exclaimed that the emperor had issued an order. The emperor's projection emerged, informing King Yunyu that Chan is at the twelve cities south of the Yangtze River. He told him to capture him. King Yunyu knelt on the ground and agreed to what he ordered. Two days later, in the cultivation space. This much space energy is sufficient to construct a teleportation array. The system advised that they just flee, and Xiaowu and his companions had the energy to follow. Chan was meditating, and he declared that Tianxin is still in Emperor Zun's grasp. Thus, he cannot forsake his comrades, and he will have to lead others to safety. And he went on to ask, what is that teleportation array you just mentioned? Yao Yao cheerfully informed him that he had enough space energy to use the treasure that was placed in front of him. The first one is that the teleportation array may be linked to any space the host has visited to create a reliable channel. 
The second is that an energy collection array may collect free energy from surrounding locations, increasing the town's energy density. It is a crucial facility on the outskirts of the teleportation array. Finally, the protective array may offer some protective capabilities as well as supporting facilities for the teleportation array. Chan was pleased since this was just what he needed. Xiao Wu was curious and asked what he was doing now. He stated that he is building a teleportation array to pick up everyone on the Shinwu continent in order to prevent being eliminated one by one by Emperor Zun. The protagonist was now positioned in the center of the teleportation array. The system triggered the teleportation array. A system signal arrived informing him that space energy is being injected and the charging status is 73%. In the Shinwu continent, a teleportation gate materialized, transporting all the members of the Earth village to an unknown realm. Even an individual whose name I cannot recall is being transported to this new world, eagerly anticipating a reunion with their master. Upon arrival, everyone found themselves on the other side of the world, bewildered by the unexpected teleportation and uncertain of their whereabouts. Tears of joy streamed down Xiaowu's face as she embraced her father, who was equally overjoyed to see her. Chan felt a sense of relief, knowing that now that everyone had arrived, he could focus on handling Emperor Zun's matters with a clear mind. Someone immediately informed Chan that something horrible happened. Saying King Yunyu Yu appeared in person and said that he had been commanded by the Emperor to capture him and imprison him in the celestial prison. King Yun Yu was already there, snorting since he was not shocked that Xiao Wu had betrayed him. Chan said in a serious tone that she had been his from the beginning to the finish, and he would bear whatever happened. He grinned as he unleashed his weapon and instructed the protagonist to demonstrate his. The system was admiring the marvelous things around her when Chan telepathically instructed her to give him the most powerful magic weapon from the Miching sect. Without a care in the world, Yao Yao casually tossed a completely random weapon into the portal. In a stroke of luck, the treasure that the system flung at the portal magically materialized in Chan's hand. But to the protagonist's surprise, what appeared in Chan's hand was not what they were expecting, it was a dice. The king couldn't help but chuckle, while the main character's fist tightened with a mix of frustration and letdown. But he chose to utilize the dice nonetheless, fusing his lightning energy to it. He then tossed the dice like a baseball player. King Yunyu was astounded by the demonstration of power. He clenched his teeth in rage, unsure whether he could handle it, but the only thing he could do was do his hardest to shatter it. He swung his sword but miraculously missed the dice. He was taken aback when he realized that the dice had become lodged around his neck. And in that moment, the dice unexpectedly detonated, swiftly ending the life of King Yunyu. Chan was no longer disappointed as he now understood the deceptive nature of this powerful tool, which lures people into dropping their guard before unleashing its full power. He was impressed by the weapons of the shameless Miching sect. Xiao Wu praised the main character, while Chan attributed the success to the weapon, showing how humble he was. The emperor notified the Sea King telepathically that King Yun Yu had died, he advised him to be cautious, and he threatened to kill him if he couldn't catch the youngster. The Sea King was not worried about King Yun Yu, considering him a foolish idiot. He stated that his domain was his from now on. A lovely woman approached and informed him that this was the blame lake in front of him. The Sea King snorted, not bothering to speak to the lady. He laughed for no apparent reason. Chan was surprised to learn that the apparently insignificant King Yun Yu had such a formidable magical weapon as the immortal boat. Xiao Wu explained that he valued this item very much. When a soldier scratched the ferry boat, he was promptly murdered. This is the equivalent of scratching the automobile, he knew this very well as he was a man after all. Xiao Wu's father bowed and informed that Gu Tuo from that location stated that he had something important to report. The main character couldn't help but crack a smile when he saw his father-in-law. He casually responded that there was no reason to bow down to him. Anyway, I forgot what this guy's name was. The man claimed that if he was willing to marry Xiao Wu, it was her blessing, but he could not breach the regulations. Chan didn't want to hear this, so he changed his mind and created an excuse that since he stated Di Gu Tuo was searching for him, he would go there immediately. Xiao Wu didn't want to be there either, but she had no option but to remain. Chan disappeared in the blink of an eye, leaving Xiao Wu's father in awe of his lightning-fast speed. Xiao Wu, always quick-witted, couldn't help but give her father a piece of her mind. When the protagonist entered the room, Di Guetua said that they were going to blame him right away since he was the one driving the ship. 
The elderly guy then advised that he start preparing early. The main character accepted his idea and directed Yao Yao to choose some formidable magic weapons for him since he may need them later. Yao Yao agreed to do this. When he walked outdoors, he saw a fog and wondered when it appeared. Xiao Wu called out to him, calling him Chan. The protagonist cut her head off since he knew Xiao Wu did not call him Chan, as she always called him Xiao Fan. The lady in disguise began to change, and she did not expect him to notice. It's so funny, she remarked, giggling. Her head emerged, and she told him loudly that if he did not surrender soon, she would consider sparing his whole crew's life. Chan wasn't going to entertain this individual's remarks. He firmly requested Yao Yao to provide him with a powerful weapon capable of dispelling illusions. A weapon materialized in the protagonist's hand. He examined it with a critical eye. He pondered the potential of this to shatter illusions. The woman created another illusion. The protagonist utilized their expertise to activate the weapon. As soon as the weapon was activated, a brilliant glow emanated from it. And it dispelled the illusion, and the weapon absorbed the woman along with the mist inside it. The woman urgently called out for assistance. Chan's impressive strength left the people in awe. Suddenly, someone used his talent, called the High Tianqing Feast Array. Many passengers were blasted off the ship, including Chan, who was almost blown away. The Sea King smiled as he caught Chan's allies. The Sea King believed that the protagonist was now defenseless, and now that his family and friends were in his hands, he proposed that he submit. The main character was not surprised by his shamelessness in wanting him to submit so that he might kill him. Because Chan refused to submit, the Sea King unleashed thousands of ghosts to devour his allies. The lady urged the Sea King to be cautious. She advised that he confine him first before playing with him. Yao Yao handed Chan another weapon, which he recognized as the Cattail Leaf Fan, and he questioned, could it be a treasure like a banana fan? The main character opted not to worry about it just now, and flames emerged from the weapon. The protagonist utilized his own might to fuel the weapon's flames, and the Sea King laughed and insulted his abilities. In his arrogance, the fire engulfed both individuals, causing them to cry out in agony. Interestingly, the fire spared Chan's allies, singling out only these two for its scorching flames. As the Sea King watched the flames engulfing the surroundings, he couldn't comprehend why the fire seemed impossible to put out. Beside him, the woman pleaded for her life, desperate to be spared from the impending danger. She was willing to do anything, even offer herself as a servant, in order to survive. Unfortunately, they perished in the fire. The fire was incredibly intense, completely obliterating everything in its path. The weapon in Chan's hand was destroyed because it couldn't handle his immense power. He felt disappointed that many of them were disposable, which was quite unfortunate. Xiao Wu approached him and embraced him tightly, overwhelmed by fear and the belief that her life was in imminent danger. Chan reassured her, assuring her that the fire he had unleashed would not harm her or anyone else. The Empress informed Mr. Chan that the two immortal kings, dispatched by Emperor Zun, may have reached a crucial stage in his ritual. They need to act quickly to stop him. Chan then instructed Gutua to accelerate their pace in order to disrupt Regal's nefarious ritual. After three days, Chan and the others finally reached their destination. The experienced samurai observed the approaching ship. He was well aware of the emperor's command to halt Chan. The demon samurai was surrounded by crackling lightning, causing the ground to fracture beneath him. A substantial rock emerged from the ground and swiftly ascended towards the ship, narrowly missing it by a mere inch. And the ship started to shake violently, prompting Chan to descend and investigate. He used his spiritual energy to land on the ground safely. He then engaged the demon samurai, unleashing a powerful combination of fire and lightning. However, despite his best efforts, the demon samurai's armor remained impenetrable to these skills. An ominous and fiery aura emanated from the demon samurai's body, while a mysterious tool materialized above his head. The protagonist skillfully evaded the attack, prompting him to command Yao Yao to provide him with a powerful weapon capable of breaking through armor. She promptly took care of it. However, she informed him that there was no weapon capable of breaking armor and suggested he use this alternative, tossing him another weapon. Chan caught the weapon and was taken aback when he had to use this trick. The protagonist skillfully wielded his needle, confidently showcasing his expertise in the art of embroidery. 
With a powerful shout, he unleashed the full potential of his unique technique, known as the flying needle, while the formidable samurai demonstrated his own mastery by employing the sutra body protection. However, the needle pierced through the sutra body protection and headed directly towards his heart. The demon samurai was astonished and wanted to say something. However he, fell down dead. Chan advised Xiaowu about the intensity of the upcoming battle. He asked if she could do it. Confidently, she shared that she had developed more strength during her recent practice session on the boat. Xiaowu and the Empress were prepared to engage in battle. They all entered the palace, and Chan boldly confronted Emperor Zun, questioning why he hadn't wanted to see him and stating his intention to end his life. Emperor Zun commanded a group of individuals to launch an assault on Chan. The main character successfully defended against the attack using his blue energy. It is worth noting that the four kings have perished, leaving only one remaining individual who still requires elimination Emperor Zun. He wielded an unfamiliar blade, infusing it with his focused energy. He recognized the quality of this blade. He skillfully launched his blade towards Emperor Zun. Emperor Zun didn't have time to move. The blade pierced his neck, leaving him in a state of shock. Chan turned around, believing that he was finished. Xiaowu felt a sense of satisfaction after emerging victorious over Emperor Zun, marveling at his ability to defeat him with a single move. The Empress expressed her disapproval and informed Chan that this individual was not Emperor Zun. A significant surge of power was sensed, and the visage of Emperor Zun materialized. He chuckled triumphantly, exclaiming that he had achieved a breakthrough and that he was now impervious to any attempts to confine him. He extended his massive hand, shouting for all of them to die. Chan urged everyone to quickly flee the scene, as Emperor Zun had reached the formidable Yuanshan realm. Emperor Zun forcefully struck the ground, but fortunately, they were beyond his reach. Chan turned around and made the decision for the three of them to go first, as he was determined to return and rescue Tian Xian. The Empress made a strong case, emphasizing that his return could be perilous, considering Emperor Zun's successful mission and the potential danger he might face. The main character was about to argue, but their attention was diverted when someone called out to them, causing them to quickly look over their shoulder. Upon his observation, he noticed the presence of the elderly gentleman and Tian Xian. The protagonist was filled with joy, instructing everyone to quickly board the ferry boat as it was time for their escape. Emperor Zun was determined to prevent their escape. He forcefully struck his hand against the boat, resulting in a broken piece. The protagonist repaired the boat using his ice skill. Emperor Zun vehemently declared that there was no escape and that the only way to cleanse the guild of their transgressions against Tian Wei was through the sacrifice of their own lives. Chan telepathically asked Yao Yao if there was a magical weapon that could beat Yuanshan. Yao Yao said that the Miqing sect's magic weapons are all aimed at the heaven-defying realm, and she lied by implying that he can accomplish nothing with those at the Yuanshan level. Xiao Wu did not want Xiao Fan to be worried about them so that he could use his true power to destroy him. In the back of his mind, he reasoned that Emperor Zun's soul was so vast that his spiritual clone was not enough to pick his teeth. Emperor Zun was determined not to let them go, and golden energy streamed right from his palm to the demon samurai. The demon samurai was immediately revived and stood up as he was surrounded by golden light. Emperor Zun gave the demon samurai wings to reach the protagonist and others faster. Once he finished and stabilized his cultivation, he plans to kill them all. He fluttered his wings and soared at tremendous speeds. The demon samurai used his new spirit force to manufacture arrows and shoot them at the boat. The main character created an ice barrier, but it crumbled under the onslaught of the arrows. Chan inquired if the immortal can boat drove quicker. The empress remarked that the eternal boat is now half crippled, and the capacity to fly is already at its maximum. He sighed, realizing that they could only do their best and postpone things for a long time. He made several mind clones, but they were smaller. The clones were little, yet they were enough to deflect the arrows aimed at him. Di Gutua informed his master that they had arrived at Baiming Lake. As long as we cross through here, we have left the palace and may use the ferry boat's teleportation ability. Xiao Wu became concerned as she saw Chan's fatigued expression. She pondered whether even he was no match for the emperor of the Yuan Shen realm. The protagonist was relieved as he wanted to return to the Shinwu continent using the teleportation array. Chan built a barrier around the boat, but the demon samurai, who was fighting it, was able to shake it. 
The demon samurai chuckled and inquired what he was going to do with Qian Huan and Han Hai. And at that point, both of them were resurrected, and Chan's eyes widened in surprise. All of their eyes glowed, and the demon samurai informed him that he was impressed that he had an incredible ability to kill four of his immortal kings in a succession. Qian Huan and Han Hai utilized their ability to call a large number of ghosts, who encircled the heavenly boat. The mind clones were doing all in their power to protect the boat and the people on board. All of the clones ran out of power and disappeared since they could no longer keep up. Chan remained concentrated on keeping the barriers steady. The protagonist demanded that he do it right now, and the elderly guy charged up a lot of energy. A gigantic teleportation gate appeared, and the boat entered it. The spacecraft disappeared, and the three of them stopped attacking. None of them were concerned that they had run away. They found it amusing that they believed they could escape. In the Miching sect territory, the protagonist found himself under immense pressure. However, they swiftly commanded everyone to enter the magic circle. Chan's intention was to remain behind and dismantle the teleportation array, ensuring that their pursuers would be unable to locate them. They returned to the Shinwu continent and completely obliterated the magic circle. None of the kings were bothered by their escape to the Shinwu continent. Xiao Wu was concerned about Chan's situation in that realm. The Empress provided reassurance, mentioning Mr. Chen's impressive cultivation, suggesting that the Emperor might not be able to match him. Xiao Wu made a strong argument, saying Xiao Fan had never had such a look before. All of them remembered how the Four King combined their powers from a large golden blade. While they were doing this, the main character yelled, instructing everyone to enter one by one and teleport back to the Shenwu continent. Xiao Wu wanted to remain with him. But before Chan could argue, the four kings struck, but fortunately, the main character erected a barrier to protect both of them. Chan was in a rush, informing his wife that they should leave the clones here to destroy the teleportation array. Xiao Wu sensed that he was lying to her because he intended to remain here as well, the other already left. The clones advised him to leave quickly because they would destroy the teleportation array and prevent the emperor from reaching the Shinwu continent. Both of them left going to the teleportation array, one of the clone yelled at the old idiot, Emperor Zun, that he could play alone since he would no longer accompany him. But, despite the clone's words, the assaults continued. The other clones emitted a radiant glow, while this particular one developed a plump physique. They burst into a smile, creating a universally recognizable symbol with their explosion. The three individuals were taken aback by the immense explosion, finding themselves caught in the ensuing blast. After the explosion subsided, the teleportation array vanished, and the four kings were once again obliterated. Emperor Zun let out a chuckle, fully aware that the four immortal kings were freely exerting their influence within his territory. Chan couldn't run away from him. Upon the arrival of everyone on the Shinwu continent, Chan appeared after minutes after everyone else. Xiao Wu and Xiao Yin approached him and embraced him warmly. He reciprocated their embrace. All three of them moved away, and Chan consoled them, informing them that the teleportation array had been destroyed and no one could find them here. Tian Xian only watched them in sadness blaming herself, claiming that it was all her fault and that Chan and everyone else would not be in such a situation. The Empress comforted her with a sympathetic smile, saying it wasn't over and she couldn't blame her for it. The demonic ant asked the old tree what he thought the master could do now. The old tree was meditating as a blue aura enveloped the whole tree he told him to say less and see more. Chan stood in front of everyone, telling them that, although things had taken some unexpected turns this time, but everyone had benefited greatly from it. Suddenly, Emperor Zun's avatar came on the Shinwu continent, and he labeled the protagonist foolish. He was disappointed with the whole realm, and everyone looked up in disbelief. Emperor Zun's true form emerged his aura was surrounding him, and his eyes were glowing. He questioned Chan if he believed that a simple Shinwu continent could defend him. The main character couldn't believe this as he completely destroyed the teleportation circle he wondered how he could catch up. A powerful hand materialized from Emperor Zun's palm, poised to bring destruction upon all. The dragon vine made every effort to obstruct the enormous hand. However, it fell short of expectations. The ant was filled with frustration as it witnessed its friends getting injured. A fiery energy enveloped its body, causing it to grow in size. Once it reached maturity, it let out a furious roar, expressing its desire for this bastard to perish. Many people observed the enormous ant with a sense of apprehension. 
The emperor swiftly eliminated the threat by swiftly removing its head, resulting in its immediate demise. Xiao Bai displayed his true form, sprouting wings from its back. The vixen followed suit, as they both chose to intervene, joining forces with Xiao Hu to restrain him. Xiao Bai earnestly pleaded with his master to hurry up and leave with everyone. Chan wanted to bring his beloved pets along. However, it was already too late when they decided to confront Emperor Zun, and they all abruptly changed direction to head elsewhere. Suddenly, the place where Xiao Bai and Xiao Hu were fighting Emperor Zun exploded, causing Chan to stop in shock. Everyone was saddened, but they had to move on. The Empress encouraged the protagonist, telling him that he needed to change and become stronger in order to avenge Xiao Bai and the others. Chan was previously aware of this, but in order to do so, he needed to endure this bad situation so that he could avenge his dog and others. The protagonist telepathically requested Yao Yao if she could transport everyone to other worlds together. The system had enough energy to do so, and she reported that the new world's coordinates are being calibrated, with collective teleportation accessible in 20 minutes. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, if you're interested in seeing more, feel free to hit the like button and leave a comment for suggestions on what you'd like to see next.